The CBC now presents the first in the 1962 series, The Massey Lectures. The speaker is Northrop Fry, Professor of English and Principal of Victoria College in the University of Toronto. The general series was inaugurated last year by the CBC as a permanent lectureship, named for the Right Honourable Vincent Massey, C.H. Each year, a distinguished speaker is invited to write and broadcast a number of lectures, which will later be published in book form. Professor Fry has chosen as a general title for his series of six lectures, The Educated Imagination. In these programs, he will develop a theory on the place and purpose of a literary education in the 20th century society. Now the first lecture, The Motive for Metaphor. Professor Fry. For the past 25 years, I have been teaching and studying English literature in a university. As in any other job, certain questions stick in one's mind not because people keep asking them, but because they're the questions inspired by the very fact of being in such a place. What good is the study of literature? Does it help us to think more clearly, or feel more sensitively, or live a better life than we could without it? What is the function of the teacher and scholar, or of the person who calls himself, as I do, a literary critic? What difference does the study of literature make in our social or political or religious attitude? In my early days, I thought very little about such questions, not because I had any of the answers, but because I assumed that anybody who asked them was naive. I think now that the simplest questions are not only the hardest to answer, but the most important to ask. So I'm going to raise them and try to suggest what my present answers are. I say try to suggest because there are only more or less inadequate answers to such questions. There aren't any right answers. The kind of problem that literature raises is not the kind that you ever solve. There are two things in particular that I want to discuss with you. In school, and in university, there's a subject called English in English-speaking countries. English means, in the first place, the mother tongue. As that, it's the most practical subject in the world. You can't understand anything or take any part in your society without it. Wherever illiteracy is a problem, it's as fundamental a problem as getting enough to eat or a place to sleep. The native language takes precedence over every other subject of study. Nothing else can compare with it in usefulness. But then you find that every mother tongue in any developed or civilized society turns into something called literature. If you keep on studying English, you find yourself trying to read Shakespeare and Milton. Here you don't seem to be in quite the same practical and useful area. Shakespeare and Milton, whatever their merits, are not the kind of thing you must know to hold any place in society at all. A person who knows nothing about literature may be an ignoramus, but many people don't mind being that. Every child realizes that literature is taking him in a different direction from the immediately useful. And a good many children complain loudly about this. Two questions I want to deal with then are, first, what is the relation of English as the mother tongue to English as a literature? Second, what is the social value of the study of literature? And what is the place of the imagination that literature addresses itself to in the learning process. Let's start with the different ways there are of dealing with the world we're living in. Suppose you're shipwrecked on an uninhabited island in the South Seas. The first thing you do is to take a long look at the world around you, a world of sky and sea and earth and stars and trees and hills. You see this world as objective, as something set over against you and not yourself or related to you in any way. 
and you notice two things about this objective world. In the first place, it doesn't have any conversation. It's full of animals and plants and insects going on with their own business, but there's nothing that responds to you. It has no morals and no intelligence, or at least none that you can grasp. It may have a shape and a meaning, but it doesn't seem to be a human shape or a human meaning. Even if there's enough to eat and no danger as animals, you feel lonely and frightened and unwanted in such a world. In the second place, you find that looking at the world as something set over against you splits your mind in two. You have an intellect that feels curious about it and wants to study it, and you have feelings or emotions that see it as beautiful or austere or terrible. You know that both these attitudes have some reality, at least for you. If the ship you were erect in was the western ship, you'd probably feel that your intellect tells you more about what's really there in the outer world, and that your emotions tell you more about what's going on inside you. If your background were oriental, you'd be more likely to reverse this and say that the beauty or terror was what was really there, and that your instinct to count and classify and measure and pull to pieces was what was inside your mind. But whether your point of view is western or eastern, intellect and emotion never get together in your mind as long as you're simply looking at the world. They alternate and keep you divided between them. The language you use on this level of the mind is the language of consciousness or awareness. This is the speculative or contemplative position of the mind, the position in which the arts and sciences begin, although they don't stay there very long. The sciences begin by accepting the facts and the evidence about an outside world without trying to alter them. Science proceeds by accurate measurement and description and follows the demands of the reason rather than the emotions. What it deals with is there, whether we like it or not. The emotions are unreasonable. For them, it's what they like and don't like that comes first. We'd be naturally inclined to think that the arts follow the path of emotion, in contrast to the sciences. Up to a point they do, but there's a complicating factor. That complicating factor is the contrast between I like this and I don't like this. In this Robinson Crusoe life I've assigned you, you may have moods of complete peacefulness and joy, moods when you accept your island and everything around you, you wouldn't have such moods very often, and when you had them, they'd be moods of identification, when you felt that the island was a part of you, and you a part of it. That is not the feeling of consciousness or awareness, where you feel split off from everything that's not your perceiving self. Your habitual state of mind is the feeling of separation which goes with being conscious, and the feeling, this is not a part of me, soon becomes, this is not what I want. Notice the word want. We'll be coming back to it. So you soon realize that there's a difference between the world you're living in and the world you want to live in. The world you want to live in is a human world, not an objective one. It's not an environment, but a home. It's not the world you see but the world you build out of what you see. You go to work to build a shelter or plant a garden, and as soon as you start to work, you've moved into a different level of human life. You're not separating only yourself from nature now, but constructing a human world and separating it from the rest of the world. Your intellect and emotions are now both engaged in the same activity so there's no longer any real distinction between them. As soon as you plant a garden or a crop, you develop the conception of a weed, the plant you don't want in there. But you can't say that weed 
is either an intellectual or an emotional conception because it's both at once. Further, you go to work because you feel you have to and because you want something at the end of the work. That means that the important categories of your life are no longer the subject and the object, the watcher and the things being watched. The important categories are what you have to do and what you want to do. In other words, necessity and freedom. One person by himself is not a complete human being, so I'll provide you with another shipwreck refugee of the opposite sex and an eventual family. Now you're a member of a human society. This human society, after a while, will transform the island into something with a human shape. What that human shape is, is revealed in the shape of the work you do. The buildings, such as they are, the paths through the woods, the planted crops fenced off against whatever animals want to eat them. These things, these rudiments of city, highway, garden, and farm are the human form of nature, or the form of human nature, whichever you like. This is the area of the applied arts and sciences, and it appears in our society as engineering and agriculture and medicine and architecture. In this area, we can never say clearly where the art stops and the science begins or vice versa. The language you, you use on this level is the language of practical sense, a language of verbs or words of action and movement. The practical world, however, is a world where actions speak louder than words. In some ways, it's a higher level of existence than the speculative level because it's doing something about the world instead of just looking at it but in itself, it's a much more primitive level. It's the process of adapting to the environment, or rather, of transforming the environment in the interests of one species that goes on among animals and plants, as well as human beings. What makes our practical life really human is a third level of the mind, a level where consciousness and practical skill come together. This third level is a vision or model in your mind of what you want to construct. There's that word want again. The actions of man are prompted by desire, and some of these desires are needs, like food and warmth and shelter. One of these needs is sexual, the desire to reproduce and bring more human beings into existence but there's also a desire to bring a social human form into existence, the form of cities and gardens and farms that we call civilization. Many animals and insects have this social form too, but man knows that he has it. He can compare what he does with what he can imagine being done. So we begin to see where the imagination belongs in the scheme of human affairs. It's the power of constructing possible models of human experience. In the world of the imagination, anything goes that's imaginatively possible, but nothing really happens. If it did happen, it would move out of the world of imagination into the world of action. We have three levels of the mind now, and a language for each of them, which in English-speaking societies means an English for each of them. There's the level of consciousness and awareness, where the most important thing is the difference between me and everything else. The English of this level is the English of ordinary conversation, which is mostly monologue, as you'll soon realize if you do a bit of eavesdropping or listening to yourself. We can call it the language of self-expression. Then there's the level of social participation, the working or technological language of teachers and preachers and politicians and advertisers and lawyers and journalists and scientists. 
we have already called this the language of practical sense. Then there's the level of imagination, which produces the literary language of poems and plays and novels. They're not really different languages, of course, but three different reasons for using words. On this basis, perhaps, we can distinguish the arts from the sciences. Science begins with a world we have to live in, accepting its data and trying to deduce its laws. From there, it moves towards the imagination. It becomes a mental construct, a model of a possible way of interpreting experience. The further it goes in this direction, the more it tends to speak the language of mathematics, which is really one of the languages of the imagination, along with literature and music. You can't distinguish the arts from the sciences by the mental processes the people in them use. They both operate on a mixture of hunch and common sense. A highly developed science and a highly developed art are very close together, psychologically and otherwise. Still, the fact that they start from opposite ends, even if they do meet in the middle, makes for one important difference between them. Science learns more and more about the world as it goes on. It evolves and improves. A physicist today knows more physics than Newton did, even if he's not as great a scientist. But literature begins with a possible model of experience, and what it produces is the literary model we call the classic. Literature doesn't evolve or improve or progress. We may have dramatists in the future who will write plays as good as King Lear, though they'll be very different ones, but drama as a whole will never get better than King Lear. King Lear is it, as far as drama is concerned. So is Oedipus Rex, written 2,000 years earlier than that, and both will be models of dramatic writing as long as the human race endures. Social conditions may improve. Most of us would rather live in 19th century United States than in 13th century Italy. And for most of us, Whitman's celebration of democracy makes a lot more sense than Dante's Inferno. But it doesn't follow that Whitman is a better poet than Dante. Literature won't line up with that kind of improvement. So we find that everything that does improve, including science, leaves the literary artist out in the cold. Writers don't seem to benefit much by the advance of science, although they thrive on superstitions of all kinds. And you certainly wouldn't turn to contemporary poets for guidance or leadership in the 20th century world. You'd hardly go to Ezra Pound with his fascism and social credit and Confucianism and anti-Semitism. Or to Yeats with his spiritualism and fairies and astrology. Or to D.H. Lawrence, who will tell you that it's a good thing for servants to be flogged because that restores the precious current of blood reciprocity between servant and master. Or to T.S. Eliot, who will tell you that to have a flourishing culture we should educate an elite, keep most people living in the same spot, and never disestablish the Church of England. The novelists seem to be a little closer to the world they're living in, but not much. When communists talk about the decadence of bourgeois culture, this is the kind of thing they always bring up. Their own writers don't seem to be any better, though, just duller. So the real question is a bigger one. Is it possible that literature, especially poetry, is something that a scientific civilization like ours will eventually outgrow? Man has always wanted to fly, and thousands of years ago he was making sculptures of winged bulls and telling stories about people who flew so high on artificial wings that the sun melted them off. In an Indian play 1,500 years old, Shakuntala, 
there's a god who flies around in a chariot that to a modern reader sounds very much like a private aeroplane. Interesting that the writer had so much imagination, but do we need such stories now that we have private aeroplanes? This is not a new question. It was raised 150 years ago by Thomas Love Peacock, who was a poet and a very brilliant one. He wrote an essay called Four Ages of Poetry, in which he said that poetry was the mental rattle that awakened the imagination of mankind in its infancy, but that now, in an age of science and technology, the poet has outlived his social function. A poet in our times, said Peacock, is a semi-barbarian in a civilized community. He lives in the days that are past, his ideas, thoughts, feelings, associations are all with barbarous manners, obsolete customs, and exploded superstitions. The march of his intellect is like that of a crab, backwards. Peacock's essay annoyed his friend Shelley, who wrote another essay called A Defense of Poetry to refute it. Shelley's essay is a wonderful piece of writing but it's not likely to convince anyone who needs convincing. I shall be spending a good deal of my time on this question of the relevance of literature in the world of today, and I can only indicate the general lines my answer will take. There are two points I can make now, one simple, the other more difficult. The simple point is that literature belongs to the world man constructs not to the world he sees, to his home, not his environment. Literature's world is a concrete human world of immediate experience. The poet uses images and objects and sensations much more than he uses abstract ideas. The novelist is concerned with telling stories, not with working out arguments. The world of literature is human in shape a world where the sun rises in the east and sets in the west over the edge of a flat earth in three dimensions, where the primary realities are not atoms or electrons but bodies, and the primary forces not energy or gravitation but love and death and passion and joy. It's not surprising if writers are often rather simple people not always what we think of as intellectuals, and certainly not always any freer of silliness or perversity than anyone else. What concerns us is what they produce, not what they are. And poetry, according to Milton, who ought to have known, is more simple, sensuous, and passionate than philosophy or science. The more difficult point takes us back to what we said when we were on that South Sea Island. Our emotional reaction to the world varies from I like this to I don't like this. The first, we said, was a state of identity, a feeling that everything around us was part of us. And the second is the ordinary state of consciousness or separation, where art and science begin. Art begins as soon as I don't like this turns into this is not the way I could imagine it. At the level of ordinary consciousness, the individual man is the center of everything, surrounded on all sides by what he isn't. At the level of practical sense or civilization, there's a human circumference, a little cultivated world with a human shape, fenced off from the jungle and inside the sea and the sky. But in the imagination, anything goes that can be imagined, and the limit of the imagination is a totally human world. Here we recapture in full consciousness that original lost sense of identity with our surroundings, where there is nothing outside the mind of man or something identical with the mind of man. Religions present us with visions of eternal and infinite heavens or paradises which have the form of the cities 
and gardens of human civilization, like the Jerusalem and Eden of the Bible, completely separated from the state of frustration and misery that bulks so large an ordinary life. We're not concerned with these visions as religion, but they indicate what the limits of the imagination are. They indicate, too, that in the human world, the imagination has no limits, if you follow me. We said that the desire to fly produced the aeroplane. But people don't get into planes because they want to fly. They get into planes because they want to get somewhere else faster. What's produced the aeroplane is not so much a desire to fly as a rebellion against the tyranny of time and space. And that's a process that can never stop, no matter how high our teetops and blends may go. For each of these six talks, I've taken a title from some work of modern literature. And my title for this one is The Motive for Metaphor from a poem by Wallace Stevens. Here's the poem. You like it under the trees in autumn because everything is half dead. The wind moves like a cripple among the leaves and repeats words without meaning. In the same way, you were happy in spring with the half colors of quarter things, the slightly brighter sky, the melting clouds, the obscure moon, the obscure moon lighting an obscure world of things that would never be quite expressed, where you yourself were never quite yourself and did not want nor have to be. Desiring the exhilarations of changes, the motive for metaphor, shrinking from the weight of primary noon, the ABC of being, the ruddy temper, the hammer of red and blue, the hard sound, steel against intimation, the sharp flash, the vital, arrogant, fatal, dominant X. What Stevens calls the weight of primary noon, the ABC of being, and the dominant X, is the objective world, the world set over against us. Outside literature, the main motive for writing is to describe this world. But literature itself uses language in a way which associates our minds with it. There are two main kinds of association, analogy and identity, two things that are like each other and two things that are each other. One produces the figure of speech called a simile, the other produces the figure called metaphor. In descriptive writing, you have to be careful of associative language. The poet, however, uses these two crude, primitive, archaic forms of thought in the most uninhibited way because his job is not to describe nature, but to show you a world completely absorbed and possessed by the human mind. The motive for metaphor, according to Wallace Stevens, is a desire to associate and finally to identify the human mind with what goes on outside it. Because the only genuine joy you can have is in those rare moments when you feel that although we may know in part, as Paul said, we are also a part of what we know. You have heard the first in this year's series, The Massey Lectures. The speaker is Professor Northrop Fry, Principal of Victoria College in the University of Toronto. The lectures will be prepared in book form, and details about price and availability will be given in a later program. Next week, The Singing School. This is the CBC Radio Network.